Uh, if you've got a Bible this morning, I hope that you do. After all, it's what we are supposed to as Christians stake our lives, our faith, our beliefs upon. Go ahead and grab it and head with me to the book of Revelation one last time. We're in Revelation chapter three this morning. We are not doing an exploration of the entire book of Revelation, as you know if you've been here with us. But we are exploring together, or we have been for the last two months, the words of Jesus, the revelation of Jesus. We saw this remarkable, stunning, culture-shattering, mind-altering vision of Jesus in chapter one from John. And it is the God of all glory. It is the King of all grace to his people. And he speaks to his people and he speaks with specificity to seven actual local churches in the region of Asia Minor in the first century, toward the close of the first century. And he has a word for each of them. But because he is the living, resurrected, glorious Christ, he is the God of eternity, when he speaks in specificity to those seven legitimate, actual local churches in the first century, he speaks in power legitimately to us today as his church and as his people. And so the words for these seven churches are the words for us. And most of us, probably all of us, would find ourselves in one of those seven categories, so to speak, these themes that we've seen in the video every week before us. And as I said last week, a pattern begins to emerge as you study the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3. And the pattern is pretty simple. Uh, the second church, Smyrna, and the sixth church, second to the last church, Philadelphia, they're the only churches that bear no correction and no reproof. Uh, they, they rise up as this glowing example for us as believers, as followers of Christ, of what Christians are supposed to do and how we are supposed to operate and what the church is supposed to look like. In the face of uh, cultural antagonism, in the face of idolatry and opposition, the churches of Smyrna and Philadelphia remained steadfast. And so the word to them was remain there, remain faithful, remain devoted, remain committed to me. And so some of us struggling as we are, if we can honestly say, you know what, my heart is bent toward the Lord and I, I love Christ and I'm striving, endeavoring to please him and honor him in my life, the word for us throughout this series, it's a word of encouragement, has been remain. It's so easy to slide back. It's so easy to compromise. And then the third, fourth, and fifth churches, the church at Pergamum, the church at Thyatira, and the church of Sardis, have all in their own unique ways compromised the gospel and bowed to the idols of the culture around them. And so while they're still maintaining their Christianity on the surface, something has gone deplorably wrong with their worship and has affected their lifestyle and has affected their churches. And so the word to each of those churches is repent and return to the truth, return to the way. Stop compromising the exclusivity of Christ or the power and sufficiency of the gospel, return to the way. But the first church, Ephesus, and the seventh church, Laodicea, which we'll see this morning, are different. There's nothing really on the surface, nothing that you could observe that's particularly wrong with these churches. Seemingly, especially as we see with Ephesus, their theology is in order. They're students of scripture. They're having their Bible studies. They're doing their home groups. They're immersed in exegetical study, it seems like, every Sunday. The church is reputable in the community. They're serving their community. They're faithful in their service, faithful in their obedience to Christ. And so they would be seen as a commendable church. And yet with Ephesus, we saw where something really diabolical, in spite of all the good they were doing, something diabolical had gone wrong. They had abandoned or neglected or left, forsaken the love that was supposed to be preeminent in their lives, the love for Christ. And so while they love to talk about Christ and they love to think about Christ and they love to speculate about Christ, it seemed like there was very little actual love for Christ. And Laodicea is a little different in that regard. And so this morning, we're going to see what was going on here in the seventh church, the church that has been compared most to the North American church, the church of Laodicea. So chapter three, verse 14. And to the angel or the messenger of the church in Laodicea, Right. So we'll pause here as we've done every week to try to explore together 
Uh, why does Jesus speak in such a way to this church? What is the context there? And why would he reveal himself as he does and give the instruction that he does and make the connections that he does? So Laodicea is the southernmost church. As a matter of fact, I'll pull up the map again for us here. This is the ancient Roman postal route, as I've said every week. And we began in Ephesus, which if we were drawing a modern correlation, as you guys know by now, it would be like New York City today. It was a port city around the Aegean. It was the most prestigious, the most notable, the most important, the most culture shaping of the seven cities, a population of north of 200,000 people, which was massive in their day in the first century. That's Ephesus. And then you move to the north about 60 miles to the beautiful, it's called the Ornament of Asia, city of Smyrna, also right on the Aegean, the closest access port to Athens, Greece. And so a city of commerce, a city of opulence, a city of beauty. Uh, and we would compare that today, if you remember uh, from a few weeks ago, we compare it to kind of like Beverly Hills and Hollywood and LA, the who's who of society, the celebrities, they live there in, in Smyrna and Homer was born and raised there in Smyrna. And then you go to the north and you come to Pergamum, 100 miles to the north of Smyrna. And Pergamum is the law-making city. It's where the Senate, where Congress would sit. It's, uh, so it's like our modern day Washington, D.C. Uh, and that's the feeling we got from Pergamum. And then down to the east, southeast, you come to the little kind of out of the way town of Thyatira. And unlike the first three, it's not very notable. It's kind of marginalized. It's not going to show up in records. Um, as a matter of fact, Pliny, the younger uh, set of Thyatira, as, as I might have mentioned in our study, um, Thyatira and other unimportant cities. Like that's how they describe Thyatira. And so we said this would be like Clearwater today. Like that's how we would see it. It's not that important. It's not that significant. You don't hear about it in the news very often. It's just kind of a suburb. And then down to Sardis we came, and Sardis was in the first century Sin City. That's how it was seen by this really deplorable culture. And so it'd be like Las Vegas today, very massive, very influential city. And then 27 miles to the Southeast is Philadelphia. And Philadelphia is in some ways like Thyatira, a little bit larger, a little more significant. And so the modern equivalent in my mind would be like St. Augustine over on our other coast where people go there to visit and it, has, it holds some level of importance, but it's not a New York city or a Los Angeles. And then down here to the South, in the beautiful, stunning Lycos River Valley, on the cusp of the mountains is Laodicea. And Laodicea, if we had to put it in a modern context, it would be potentially like Denver, probably. It was a banking center. It was incredibly commercial, incredibly wealthy. And the reason for its wealth was really threefold. Um, one is that it is the banking center of the entire region. And so it has massive amounts of monetary goods kept there in Laodicea. A second reason for this is many of the notable prestigious physicians of the first century made their home in Laodicea. They had a God, we'll get to in a second, man who they worshiped, who was a healer God, a delivering God. And so um, for them, these physicians would gravitate and they had produced a eye salve that was known across the entire Roman empire for treating uh, ailments of the eye. And so they're known for this and other medical advancements and achievements. And then a third reason for this is they're a leading uh, export, much like Thyatira, of textiles. But they were a leader in this really luxurious black wool that the sheep in their region that they would tend to and groom would produce annually. And so they would make these really, really beautiful, really soft wool garments of all black that many of the nobility and celebrities of their day would wear. And so that is Laodicea. Now that's not enough. You gotta have an export means for the banking center and the medical advancements and the textile industry, and they did. Uh, Laodicea was situated strategically right on the primary road. If you know anything about the topography of Asia Minor, it is extremely hilly, very mountainous, and you had to navigate by road. And the road that connected Ephesus to the interior all the way to Antioch and beyond ran directly through the center of the city of Laodicea. As a matter of fact, if you travel to Laodicea today, it's been destroyed since the fourth century due to earthquakes, but you can still see this. This is the road leading into the interior. So that would be the mountains and Antioch to the east 
And if you were to turn around from this road and face west, 100 miles removed from this road, you would arrive upon Ephesus. So if you were traveling from Ephesus to the east or from the east to Ephesus and to the Aegean and beyond, you had to pass through Laodicea. And so it became this incredible, reputable, important town of industry and commerce and opulence and monetary gains. The leading god of, so the, um, if you study the history of Laodicea, they were kind of an anarchist society. Maybe that's why they've been compared to modern North America. Um, so they paid a loose allegiance to the emperor and kind of loose devotion to the gods and goddesses of the Greco-Roman world. But their primary allegiance was to Maine. And this was a Phrygian god, a barbaric god, and he was known as the Arche God. Arche is the Greek word there. It means hero. The one who kind of paves the way, the one who opens the gates. Um, the Arche, we get Archegos from that, which we find in Hebrews chapter 12. But the, um, I've talked about this before, but the Arche was the one who would go out in front of the army, the mighty man, the strong man, the representative of the king who would go out in front of the army and he would fight the strong man, the Arche from the opposing army. And whichever Arche, whichever victor, hero, conqueror, deliver one secured liberation for their army, and also caused the opposing army to have to submit to their king and to their kingdom and to come under their reign. And so that's the Arche, and that's main for them. He is known as the delivering God. He is known as the hero God. He's known as the God of completion, the God of healing, the God of protection. And so they worshiped him. That was the chief God, the premier God in Laodicea. I read this this week about Laodicea about the opulence, the magnificence, and the idolatry that existed there. It says this, covering about five square kilometers with magnificent buildings and shining marble, Laodicea had the structures of Roman and Hellenistic cities, including a central marketplace, which was called the Agora, on Syria Street, bath complexes, fountains, magnificent temples featuring Isis, Apollo, Zeus, Artemis, Aphrodite, Maine, monumental gates, a city council house, which indicated a degree of independence from Rome, public latrines, a gymnasium, a water distribution system, the largest stadium in Asia Minor holding an estimated 25,000 spectators with a double U shape that allowed it to also function as an amphitheater and be used for athletic games, gladiatorial contests, and probably arena executions. They had cemeteries, two theaters, a Western theater seating 8,000 and a Northern theater of 12,000. So they got the Regal and the AMC in their town and statutes of gods and goddesses such as Zeus, Hera, Dionysus, Aphrodite, and even Emperor Octavian. So this is Laodicea. This gives us a picture of the financial, cultural, spiritual climates of this last city that's mentioned here. And the believers in Laodicea have begun to buy in to the mentality that we need to keep up with whatever's going on. We need to be wealthy. We need to lack nothing. We need the newest of new. We need to go to the gladiatorial games and we need to purchase the tickets to the theater and we need to buy in. Even though we're still worshiping Jesus, we just need to buy into the worship of the culture around us. And so we hear Jesus in the same fashion that he's addressed the other six churches, address Laodicea this way. To the angel of the church of Laodicea, write this. The words of the Amen. Now, we're very familiar with that word. It's translated here in the, in the New Testament in English for us. Amen, translated Amen. Especially if you grew up Baptist. Because we were like, you know, at the conclusion of every prayer, it was Amen. Or uh, somebody said something in church that we really liked, especially if it was like politically motivated. We're like, Amen to that, you know, right? Um, and so that's just kind of, it's, it's a way, it's literally Amen means that is true. That separates fact from fiction. Like that's true. Jesus does this in John chapter three. He doesn't wait. He's talking to Nicodemus there. And he doesn't wait for Nicodemus to say, Amen. Uh, Jesus doesn't even wait till he's done to say Amen. Jesus, because he's Jesus, begins his statement, amen, amen, or truly, truly. This is true, this is true. I say to you, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so that's what we have there from Jesus, his own lips. And now he comes into this passage and he says, I know the speculation. I, I know the worship that goes on. I know that you might be tempted as the church to see me as one of many gods. I am the amen. 
I am the true. But it carried with it more than just the idea of fact over fiction. Our main carries with the idea of completion, a finished work. So I've got, you guys know this, most of you. I've got three kids. Spurgeon, my oldest, is nine, by far the sweetest. And I would say by far the godliest, but the other two are not godly at all. So he's just the only one who's godly. <laughs> Loves Jesus, great little kid. Love my other two pagans as well, but like he is awesome. But he has no drive. He just, he's just sweet, romantic, awesome, no drive. And so he loves Legos. And so we got him Legos, some Lego sets for Christmas. And then his birthday's in January. So we got him more Lego sets for his birthday. So he got this magnificent little like a uh, Phoenix character that you build up out of, I don't know, thousands of pieces of Legos. And typically I help him with those. And then he got for his birthday a couple of Lego sets. And one of them was this magnificent ship, like pirate ship that he's supposed to build. And um, it's been a month and a half since his birthday, or a month since his birthday. It's been a couple months now since Christmas. Both of them are started. Neither of them are anywhere close to completion. There's laying in pieces and fragments. Because at some point in time, the excitement gave way to difficulty. And for my little, sweet, uninspired boy, he was like, you know what? I think I'm going to shelf this for something else. And so the phoenix has been sitting there in his closet for a while, and the ship has been sitting on our dining room table for a month. And his mother, my wife, will say, are you ever going to finish this? Are you ever going to get this done? He's like, yeah, 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 I will. And she's like, well, get it done right now. He's like, no, no, it's going to take forever. Like, I don't want to do that. And then I'll come in, I'll be like, hey, look, I'll help you with it. Like, this will be fun. We'll build it like we have built stuff in the past. He's like, no, no, I don't want to do that. Because in his mind, I know it's become arduous. It's become difficult. And that's life. There's so many things, I mean, like, especially here in America, like where we have 13 second mindset of entertainment where we're like, oh, that sounds awesome. That sounds amazing. I'm going to buy that or I'm going to do that or I'm going to engage in that because that will be exciting and that will be fun. And we're really, really good. I mean, humanity's always been really good at starting stuff. We struggle more to complete, especially when the path becomes arduous and difficult. And so... What do we find in Jesus? And you guys know this. We find in Jesus one who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. And he completed the work that he began. And that's the idea of the amen. And he follows it up here by saying the faithful and the aletheos. And we talked about aletheos last week, but amen sep separates fact from fiction. Aletheos uh, separates um, the fraudulent from the authentic. So he says, as I am true, I am the revelation of God, I am the faithful witness, and I'm authentic. But not only that, then he says this, the words of the amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. And some of us are like, oh, hold on just a second. That kind of throws me off because Jesus didn't really have a beginning. It's not what it's talking about. It's not chronological, this word here. The Greek word for beginning here carries with the idea of rank or preeminence or prestige more than origin, far more than origin. And so he's saying, this is the most prestigious one from the very start. This is the preeminent one, the prestigious one. And the Greek word used here in the text, if you have a Greek New Testament, you can look it up for yourself, is the Greek word arche. Like here's the hero God. Here's the one who has opened up the way, who's pioneered redemption for his people. Main is not the hero God. He's not redemption. He's not salvation. He's not protection. I am the amen, I am the faithful and true witness, I am the hero God. And I have a word for you, the church. Verse 15, I know your works, he said this every week, but Laodicea is the only church that gets nothing right. There's not one word of affirmation. So happy anniversary Sunday, to all of you Laodiceans, okay? 
You are neither cold nor hot. Would, I, I wish that you were either cold or hot. So some people have mistakenly thought this is Jesus saying, um, you're, just, you're just lukewarm, you're just kind of there in the middle, you're kind of hanging out, hovering, and you're apathetic, and I would rather you be on fire for me or I'd rather you just like abandon me completely. That's not the rendering here. That's not the understanding of the text. Um, so the understanding comes from the historical context. And I don't have a map of this um, that you can see, but you might be familiar with this if you studied the book of Colossians. Uh, Laodicea is part of a triad of cities. There's the tri-city area. And there's Laodicea here in the south. And then six miles to the north is Heropolis, which is mentioned there in the book of Colossians in conjunction with Laodicea. And then 11 miles to the east is Colossae. And so Colossae is famed. It's known for many things, but one of the things it's famous for is it's year-long, constant, refreshing springs that would flow down from the mountains and replenish the area. And the people had this magnificent, readied source of fresh water at their disposal all year long, crystal clear, ice cold. So that's 11 miles to the east. Six miles to the north is Heropolis. Heropolis has these bubbling hot springs that were seen as medicinal. So if you had aches and ailments, you would go to Heropolis and you would soak there in the hot springs. And so both Colossae and Heropolis, two of these three tri-cities, had a notable source of replenishing substantive water. There was one, for all of its opulence and all of its grandeur and its strategic location, there was one massive flaw for the city of Laodicea. They had absolutely no source of fresh water. And so they built this ancient aqueduct system. These pipes, you can still see it today if you were to travel to the city of Laodicea. These piping systems, 11 miles to the east, to the fresh springs of Colossae that would channel this water from Colossae into the city of Laodicea. But as you can imagine, and they quickly found out, the soil itself and even the pipes they'd used were just full of minerals. And so as the water would be transported, not only would it lose its fresh and its cold quality, but when it exited, it was rank. It was brackish. It was tepid. Historians recorded that when you would take and you try to boil away the impurities, it would just smell up your entire home. So this is the water that's coming out and they're extremely familiar with this and this is what they have to live with. And he says, the Lord says here, the final amen, the arche, the hero God says to them, I know your works. I know everything seems to be going well on the surface. I know you have a reputation much like the people at Sardis, the Christians at Sardis, but you're not hot and you're not cold. And I kind of love this because as I'm reading it this week, I'm like, it just reiterates the reality that we all serve different needs to the body. But he's like, you're, you're, you're called to be ambassadors. You're called to be productive. And you're serving no purpose. You're just tepid. You're brackish. You're stale. You're apathetic. You're still coming to church because it's what you're supposed to do. And you're still maybe serving the needs of the church or the community because it's what you're supposed to do. And you're still holding to the truth of Christ, but it's really become just academic for you. And the passion and the fire and the genuine worshipful service is gone. And that's most likely why most scholars compare the church at Laodicea to the church in North America today. Because whether we like to admit it or not, that's where we find ourselves most often. You're not hot, you're not cold. I wish, I just wish, I long for you, my people, to be worshipfully productive for the kingdom, to be faithful, passionately faithful. So my second child, Evie, my girl, love her. She's awesome. She was, uh, love you know, know this as well, but when Danielle, my wife, was 20 weeks pregnant, the ultrasound revealed some issues around Evie's heart. And so we went in, had more testing. It was revealed she had holes in her heart, was missing a valve, all kinds of stuff. This was back five years ago now. And so um, Evie was born. And when she was born, she just looked perfect. 
I'm not just saying that because I'm her dad. Did you know how like we all are like, oh, that baby's beautiful. And then we're like, not really, you know? Like, she really was. Like, I was just like, wow, this baby's beautiful. Like, this baby's amazing. Uh, um, and, um, and maybe that's just because I'm a dad. I don't know. I don't know. Nobody's told me otherwise since then. And so um, by her, she was born. She had to go right away to the NICU. They wanted to observe. And so she's there in the NICU. I travel with her. And then we're there together with her, Danielle and I, for five days. And they're observing her. And they're like, oh, she seems great. She seems well. We know there's this issue, but she seems great. So she can go home. Just make sure you feed her enough. Make sure you watch her. And they gave us some things to look for. And so we took her home. And months began to go by and she was sleeping well and she was eating well and she was gaining weight and she was excitable and she was happy. And March 7th, 2017 came. And I snapped this picture of my little girl who was six months old. That was her, right? I mean, the, uh, to me, the picture of health, of happiness, everything was great. It was laughing, personality emerging, sleeping, eating, on the surface, healthy. But it would be the very next morning, less than 24 hours later, that we would take her in and that surgeons would have to cut her open and they'd have to repair her heart that in spite of everything appearing well on the outside, would have eventually killed her. And as I thought about Laodicea this week and I thought about my little girl who I love, I can't help but draw the correlation that there's so many churches there. And we gotta be careful that we're not there. We gotta be really careful on guard. Because I, I think this is probably uh, most likely a wake up call to the church at Laodicea. Maybe they didn't realize that apathy had set in. I've always compared it to falling asleep. You don't know you're asleep until you wake up. And so this apathy, this spiritual slumber had begun to set in. And Laodicea seemed to be oblivious to this. They just had no idea maybe that was going on because everything seems healthy. Everything seems happy. Everything seems well. And yet something devastating was taking place beneath the surface. And this is the reason for it. Verse 17. For you say, I am rich. I am prosperous. And I don't need anything. So that's your testament. You're not hot, you're not cold, you're lukewarm, you're tepid, you're brackish, you're revolting. Um, because you say, I have everything I need. I, I've, I've met all my needs. And he, he's just said in the previous verse, just, I think the tendency is to be like, well, he's kind of disappointed. No, he's distrusted. He's distrusted. Like, it's not the picture of Jesus a lot of us want to see. But he says, you're not hot, you're not cold, you're just lukewarm. Because you are lukewarm, because you're tepid and brackish, I will spit, and that Greek word literally is, I will vomit you out of my mouth. So it's not just like, oh, you know what? I'm a little disappointed you got a C on your report card. It's, I am disgusted. I am revolted by this imagery. This is not how you're supposed to be. You wouldn't drink that water coming out of the tap, that polluted water. I will not drink that. I will not celebrate with that. And so he says, the reason for this is you say, I'm rich, I'm prosperous, I don't need anything. So in 21 AD, the same, I'm sorry, 17 AD, the same earthquake that absolutely demolished the city of Philadelphia struck the city of Laodicea as well. We talked about that with Philadelphia last week. Emperor Tiberius reached out and said to them, to Philadelphia and Laodicea, hey, well, Here's funds to help you rebuild. We'll remit taxes and tribute for five years. And the Laodiceans took that. And they, even though they were far more successful and monetarily prestigious than the Philadelphians, they said, we'll take that tribute. And so they began to rebuild their city. Around the mid-20s AD, a few years later, they had rebuilt this magnificent city. And the empire said, hey, we want to build the first temple to the emperor in worship. Where will this inaugural temple go? And the Laodiceans were one city, one civilization that vied for that. They said, hey, we're prestigious, we're important, we're opulent, we have everything that we need for this. And if you remember back a few weeks ago, but the city of Smyrna won that honor. And the Laodiceans were upset. They were bitter. And the reason they, Smyrna won that honor over Laodicea is because the emperor said, um, you don't have enough money. And so the Laodiceans said, well, that will never happen again. And so about 40 years later, it was 61 AD, another massive earthquake hit Laodicea, caused catastrophic damage. 
And Rome reached out and said, hey, we'll give you funds. We'll remit tribute again. And the Laodiceans famously said, we don't need your help. We'll, we're fine. We're wealthy enough. We'll rebuild on our own. And they did. Now that's in 61. There's two different scholastic opinions on when the book of Revelation was written. I tend to lean toward the earlier writing pretty heavily, which would be around 65 to 66 AD. Four or five years after they rejected the help of the emperor, the king, as they would know it. Even if it was written some 25 years, 30 years later, still that would have been fresh in the minds of the people. And so Jesus is using that here. And he goes, you say, like you said to Rome, you say to me, we're prosperous and we're wealthy, we're rich, and we don't need anything, including you. And I know, look, they're probably going, that's not, we never said that. Like we would say that we need God. But he's basically saying, your, the confession of your life says otherwise. Like you live in such a way that you don't need me. And we have to ask ourselves, we have to, is this true of us? Like it's scary. We've talked about it many times. The scariest day for us will be when we reach the point where we just don't need God anymore. We have all of our process and all our ministries and everything in place, and we don't need God anymore. And so prayer kind of takes a back seat to meetings. And reliance on the gospel kind of becomes marginalized for strategies. And he goes, no, you become lukewarm, rancid, vomit you out of my mouth because you say, we're rich, we're great. We need nothing. Look at our social media accounts. We'll tell you that. And then, and then he says this, not realizing that you are, so you say, I don't need anything, and we're prosperous and rich. And you don't realize that you are wretched. The word literally means in pain, that you're suffering. So you're like, we're well. We got the medical center right here. Like, everything's great. And he's like, no, no, no. In the ways that matter much, you're in pain. You're suffering. You're pitiable. That word means miserable. So you're like, on the surface, you're like, look at me. Look at how awesome my life is. Like, it's just amazing. And yet internally, you're miserable. You're poor, patokos, like that's the Greek word there. It means to, to literally be completely impoverished. So your soul, even though, even though monetarily you got a, a robust bank account, like you got nice cars, nice homes, whatever, you're keeping up with the Joneses, but you are poor in the ways that matter most. You are blind. So you're like, we have the eye salve. Like we, we, we have perfect vision because of our medical advancements. But he's like, no, you actually don't. Like you're, you're blind and you're naked. You're like, oh, no, we have like this magnificent wool, these textiles, this industry, this leading exports. So the, he's like, no, you're exposed. You're vulnerable. You're placing your worth and safety value in all of these things. So that's where they find themselves in. The city of Laodicea was founded four centuries prior to the book of Revelation by Antiochus II. And Antiochus II um, was a warrior, a conqueror, and when he founded Laodicea, he named it after his most beloved wife, Laodicea, who ended up shortly thereafter poisoning Antiochus II and killing her own husband. And perhaps, perhaps that imagery from their history is in mind and in use here when he speaks about what could be equated to poisonous, harmful, vomiting out of my mouth, you say that things are great. Antiochus II thought things were great and yet wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. So a few weeks ago, I flew up to North Georgia for just a couple of days and I went over to Tampa International and Danielle always, my wife always kind of like jokes around and makes fun of me because I just like to show up super early. Um, I'm always scared of missing the flight. And so I, that day, same thing, I showed up early. And um, so I had plenty of time to get my coffee and go to the restroom. So I went to the restroom, I sat down, you know, doing what you do in restrooms. And, um, and so I'm, I'm there, I'm on my phone like, like we do and just kind of whatever. And um, someone walks into the stall right next to me, sits down. And I have a philosophy 
um, of bathroom etiquette that would say, let's not be obnoxious in the bathroom if, if we can help it. But this person did not share that philosophy of life. And so <laughs> they began to watch, uh, I'm guessing reels, because I could hear them. They were very loud. And then the person began to cackle. I mean, hysterical, obnoxious, over the top, so loud. I mean, I get it. Like, do you, be you, whatever, even in the bathroom, around people, like whatever. But I'm just like, I gotta get out of here. Like, I'm so uncomfortable right now. And so um, I exit, I'm washing my hands. There's another guy washing his hands. There's a few other guys in um, the bathroom there. And the person uh, finishes up. You hear the toilet flush. The door of their stall opens right onto me and this other guy who were washing our hands. And before I can even look into the mirror, before I turn around at all, I hear a voice that says... Uh, something to the effect of, you're not supposed to be here. And then we turn around and it's not a guy, it's a lady <laughs> who seemingly was so wrapped up in her moments and her phone there that she came in, sat down, laughed hysterically, opened the door, so convinced that her reality was true that she looked at me, another dude, and like 12 other dudes <laughs> and thought all of us were in the wrong place, Okay. <laughs> Now I kind of blacked out because I don't like I don't like social weirdness and everything, so I don't I don't really remember what happened at that point. Uh, I think I think she it seemed like she came to the realization pretty quick of, you know what, y'all are not wrong, I am wrong. But as I thought about it, that happened like a month ago, and I've been like wanting to weave it in since then, <laughs> tell you guys about this experience. And finally Laodicea came around. I was like, ah, oh, Laodicea, thank you. <laughs> because I think this is this way. Uh, comparable, at least in my mind, to this lady and to our society today. I think what had happened in Laodicea is that they had become so used to their reality that they could look out at God's reality and say from their own reality, their own bias, that's not true. You're not supposed to be there. You're not supposed to say it like that. That's not Christianity. That's not how we work. And this is the wake up call for them to say, no, 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 you're the one who's not true. You're the one who's not faithful. I am the amen. I am the faithful and true witness. And so he says here, verse number 18, look at this. He says, I counsel you to buy. And what do we buy with? It's not our works. It's his works. It's his grace. So he's like, here, I'm going to give you money. I'm going to give you allowance, gracious allowance. And I counsel you to buy. Remember, remember what they're known for? Their banking center, their gold, their monetary possessions their ISAB, their medical advancements, their textile industry. So look what he says. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by the fire so that you may actually be rich. Like buy from me what's been purified and what's critical. Buy from me white garments that you may clothe yourselves and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. Buy from me salve to anoint your eyes so that you may actually see the truth. Buy from me. Verse number 19. This has been applied to unbelievers a lot of times. And, and the imita if you're an unbeliever, you're watching today online or you're here and you don't know Jesus, the invitation is, of course, to come to Christ. Like always. But this is believers he's talking to. He says, those who I love, so countercultural, I reprove and discipline. Those who I love, I confront, I rebuke, I reprove, I discipline. So be zealous. Because I love you, I'm reproving you. Some of us don't want to hear this this morning. We like the word to Philadelphia a lot more. That was so encouraging. Can we go back to Philadelphia? But some of us need to hear the word to Laodicea. And he says, I'm giving you this word because I love you. I reprove and I discipline. So be zealous and repent. Last Tuesday, Danielle was prepping for home group and I had gotten home. I'm tired. Like I was tired. I was sitting on the couch. You guys keep me busy. Like, so I'm tired. I'm sitting there on the couch and she's vacuuming in the living room. It's amazing from the angle I'm sitting out with the sun coming through the windows, I can see everything she's missing on the floor. Now, look, I knew better than to say anything. Okay, I, get, I know that. But, but I can see everything she's kind of missing there. And in the moment I was just struck as I'm already starting to kind of prep in my mind for later to see, I'm struck with the reality of... Um, we can just naturally see the sin in other people's lives far better than we can see the sin in our own. It's just our own, our own bias, maybe self-righteousness, maybe actual righteousness, like walking with Christ, but we can see that. Jesus admits this when he's like, hey, hey, you know what? I know that person, they got, they got like a little dust mite in their eye, but you got this beam wagging around. You need to get that out first. 
And it's, it'll be easy for the latest scenes. It'll be easy for us to look at all this and be like, that guy's got problems and that girl's a mess and that person's unrepentant. And the word is for us first. Be zealous, therefore, and repent of your sin. Because we're good at repenting of other people's sins for them. I'm calling it prayer request. Behold, verse 20. I love this image of Jesus. He gives us this image. The hero of God, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Um, a well-known artist in the 19th century with this visual in mind painted what became the most famous painting of his day in the middle of the 19th century. And you can look it up online. It now hangs, the painting now hangs in St. Michael's in London. And it's a visual of Jesus there standing at the door and vines have overgrown the door and moss and weeds. It looks like it has not been opened in a long time. And the artist was questioned, almost ridiculed by one of his friends. Hey, look, Jesus is standing there, he's knocking, and there's no handle, there's no knob on this side of the door. Now, we, we understand theologically, we saw it last week, when he says, I can open a door, no one can shut, and shut a door, no one can open. Jesus doesn't need a knob to get through the door. I mean, he can come through like walls. So like he can do what he wants to do. So the image here is not of an incapacitated God, but the image from this painting, this famous painting and from Revelation 3 is of a patient God who is saying to his people who he loves, because I love you, I reprove you and I discipline you and I stand at the door and I knock. And I'm gonna keep knocking there. You're my people, you're my children, I love you. And whoever, if anyone hears my voice, which is what the church at Laodicea was called to do, this is his voice. It's what we're called to do today. Whoever hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with him. There's few things in the first century more intimate than sharing a meal together. I will eat with him and he will eat with me. And so renewed communion is what he's saying here. You've, you've drifted you become apathetic, you become brackish, you become repulsive, you become rancid. I'm not excusing that. I actually want to vomit you out of my mouth. And yet I stand at the door and knock. And if you hear my voice and you repent, zealously repent, you will come in and you'll dine with me. You'll eat with me. This is, this is the beautiful juxtaposition of Jesus that must always be taught. He, does never, he never ever condones your sin or mine, ever. And yet at the same time, if we're in Christ, he never condemns us for that either. He says, I stand at the door and I knock patiently for my people. If you will come, hear my voice, open the door, I will come in and eat with you and he with me. Verse 21 the one who conquers. And we've talked about this every week. This conquest is, yes, I mean, we see it in the, in the text here. The conquest is zealously repent. That's the conquest. That's what he's calling us to. But if anyone hears my voice and they repent, they conquer. And that conquest is only derived through my conquest. You can only conquer sin because I have conquered sin for you already. You can only live this life victoriously because I lived the life victoriously and rose in your stead so that you may rise with me. So if we understand that, the radical nature of God's grace is exhibited toward us in the living Christ. He says that, man, if you, if you will conquer, here's what happens. By my conquest, I will grant to you to sit with me on my throne. So I'm knocking at the door. By zealous repentance, you open the door and I come in and I sit with you and we dine together, friend to friend. But not only do we dine together, then I'm going to raise you up to conquest because I am the heroic God, I am the archaic God and you will sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. And I think this is, I didn't say it's Thursday night, but this is what comes to mind because you remember the disciples are like, hey, well, we're gonna all be there with you, but who's gonna be closest to you? And Jesus like, you're missing the point you're all going to be closest. Because I don't function like you guys do. Like I'm not bound to the limitations you're bound to. And so you're like, well, yeah, I might be sitting with him on his throne, but it better, better be a big throne because I'm gonna be way out on the side on the margins somewhere. He's like, no, you will sit with me. 
and you will sit with me, and you will sit with me through my conquest, now conquer in my name. So it's a really encouraging word for us. You will sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Now, the story could end here. And for a lot of people it does because they don't, you know, we just don't study history very much. But for Laodicea, it did not end there. From all indication, Laodicea repented. They came back to Christ, zealously repented, opened the door, dined with him. The Laodicean, Laodicean's church, their lukewarm legacy was not their final legacy. The church at Laodicea survived Nero's reign and Domitian's reign. The city became a seat of a Christian bishop. That means it's very prominent in Christianity. And a Christian, very important Christian council was even held there in the fourth century. Archaeologists have discovered about 20 ancient Christian chapels and churches on the site of Laodicea. The largest church of Laodicea called the Church of Laodicea took up an entire city block and dates to the beginning of the fourth century. So they repented. So I, I wrap it down. We conclude today with this word of, yeah, I know, I know it's exhortation. I know he says it's reproof and it's discipline because he loves us. But when we respond, when we, by God's grace, open the door and repent, he comes in and he dines with us. And we experience conquest through his conquest. Tertullian, I mentioned him a few weeks ago, read his book on idolatry, wrote this down. We'll conclude, wrap up our whole series with this. He says this, because this is life. It was life for Tertullian in the third century. It's life for us today. Amid these reefs and inlets, amid these shallows and straits of idolatry, faith, her sails filled by the spirit of God navigates safe if cautious, secure if intently watchful. So amidst all that's going on, all the brokenness that surrounds, all the calamity, and whenever we are faithful to the Lord, there will be calamity. There will be cause for strife. Amid all of this, amid these shallows and straits, amid all the idolatry, faith, the faith in the living Christ, faith gifted to us, Ephesians 2.8, her sails filled in our hearts by the spirit of God navigates forward. We are safe, not physically safe. We get that, but we are, our souls are safe, preserved and protected. If cautious, secure forever, if intently watchful. That's the word to the seven churches. That's the word to us here in the 21st century. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these timely words whereby we hear what you have for us, receive it as true. And they're tough words. They're tough words if we've gone astray. They're tough words if we're apathetic. They're tough words in our cultural climate today. Tough words for our souls to hear. And that's why you say again and again as you conclude here, those who have ears to hear, by my spirit and my mercy, let them hear. And may we have ears to hear. And may we be rattled from our complacency and our apathy, our stagnancy, the lukewarm aura in which we exist. May we be a passionate people for you. I understand that's going to look different for all of us, but in the ways in which it's going to look the same, it's going to be beautiful. And so, Father, make us, by your Spirit, a people who conquer, who open the door when you knock, who repent zealously so that we may dine with you, commune with you, fellowship with you, and live in your conquest.